Chapter Eleven of *The Doings of Raffles Haw* by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Chemical Demonstration. Raffles Haw led the way through the front door, and crossing over the gravelled drive, pushed open the outer door of the laboratory, the same through which the McIntyres had seen the packages conveyed from the wagon. On passing through it. Robert found that they were not really within the building, but merely in a large bare antechamber, around the walls of which were stacked the very objects which had aroused his curiosity and his father's speculations. All mystery had gone from them now, however, for while some were still wrapped in their sackcloth coverings, others had been undone and revealed themselves as great pigs of lead. "'This is my raw material,' said Raffles Haw, carelessly, nodding at the heap. "'Every Saturday I have a wagon-load sent up, which serves me for a week. "'But we shall need to work double-tides when Laura and I are married, "'and we get our great schemes under way. "'I have to be very careful about the quality of the lead, "'for, of course, every impurity is reproduced in the gold.' "'A heavy iron door led into the inner chamber.' Haw unlocked it, but only to disclose a second one about five feet further on. "'The flooring is all disconnected at night,' he remarked. "'I have no doubt that there is a good deal of gossip in the servants' hall about this sealed chamber, so I have to guard myself against some inquisitive ostler or too adventurous butler.' The inner door admitted them into the laboratory, a high, bare, whitewashed room with a glass roof. At one end was the furnace and boiler, the iron mouth of which was closed, though the fierce red light beat through the cracks and a dull roar sounded through the building. On either side, innumerable huge laden jars stood ranged in rows, tier atopping tier, while above them were columns of voltaic cells. Robert's eyes, as he glanced around, lit on vast wheels complicated networks of wire stands test tubes colored bottles graduated glasses bunsen burners porcelain insulators and all the varied debris of a chemical and electrical workshop come across here said raffles haw picking his way among the heaps of metal the coke the packing cases and the carboys of acid "'Yours is the first foot except my own, which has ever penetrated to this room since the workmen left it. My servants carried the lead into the ante-room, but come no further. The furnace can be cleaned and stoked from without. I employ a fellow to do nothing else. Now take a look in here.' He threw open a door on the further side and motioned to the young artist to enter. The latter stood silent with one foot over the threshold, staring in amazement around him. The room, which may have been some thirty feet square, was paved and walled with gold. Great brick-shaped ingots, closely packed, covered the whole floor, while, on every side, they were reared up in compact barriers to the very ceiling. The single electric lamp which lighted the windowless chamber struck a dull, murky yellow light from the vast piles of precious metal and gleamed ruddily upon the golden floor. "'This is my treasure-house,' remarked the owner. "'You see that I have rather an accumulation just now. "'My imports have been exceeding my exports. "'You can understand that I have other and more important duties "'even than the making of gold just now. "'This is where I store my output until I am ready to send it off. "'Every night, almost, I am in the habit of sending a case of it to London. "'I employ seventeen brokers in its sale. "'Each thinks that he is the only one.' and each is dying to know where I can get such large quantities of virgin gold. They say that it is the purest which comes into the market. The popular theory is, I believe, that I am a middleman acting on behalf of some new South African mine, which wishes to keep its whereabouts a secret. What value would you put upon the gold in this chamber? It ought to be worth something, for it represents nearly a week's work. Something fabulous, I have no doubt, said Robert, glancing round at the yellow barriers. Shall I say a hundred and fifty thousand pounds? Oh, dear me, it is surely worth very much more than that, cried Raffles Haw, laughing. Let me see. Suppose that we put it at three ten an ounce, which is nearly ten shillings under the mark. That makes roughly fifty-six pounds for a pound in weight. 
Now each of these ingots weighs 36 pounds, which brings their value to 2,000 and a few odd pounds. There are 500 ingots on each of the three sides of the room, but on the fourth there are only 300 on account of the door. But there cannot be less than 200 on the floor, which gives us a rough total of 2,000 ingots. So you see, my dear boy, that any broker who could get the contents of this chamber for four million pounds would be doing a nice little stroke of business. And a week's work, gasped Robert. It makes my head swim. You will follow me now while I repeat that none of the great schemes which I intend to simultaneously set in motion are at all likely to languish for want of funds. Now come into the laboratory with me and see how it is done. In the center of the workroom was an instrument like a huge vice, with two large brass-colored plates and a great steel screw for bringing them together. Numerous wires ran into these metal plates and were attached at the other end to the rows of dynamic machines. Beneath was a glass stand, which was hollowed out in the center into a succession of troughs. "'You will soon understand all about it,' said Raffles Haw, throwing off his coat and pulling on a smoke-stained and dirty linen jacket. "'We must first stoke up a little.' He put his weight on a pair of great bellows, and an answering roar came from the furnace. "'That will do. The more heat, the more electric force, and the quicker our task. Now, for the lead. Just give me a hand in carrying it.' They lifted a dozen of the pigs of lead from the floor onto the glass stand, and, having adjusted the plates on either side, Haw screwed up the handle so as to hold them in position. It used, in the early days, to be a slow process, he remarked. But now that I have immense facilities for my work, it takes a very short time. I have now only to complete the connection in order to begin. He took hold of a long glass lever, which projected from among the wires, and drew it downwards. A sharp click was heard, followed by a loud sparkling, crackling noise. Great spurts of flame sprang from the two electrodes, and the mass of lead was surrounded by an aureole of golden sparks, which hissed and snapped like pistol shots. The air was filled with the peculiar acid smell of ozone. "'The power's there is immense,' said Raffles Haw, superintending the process, with his watch upon the palm of his hand. "'It would reduce an organic substance to protyle instantly.' It is well to understand the mechanism thoroughly, for any mistake might be a grave matter for the operator. You are dealing with gigantic forces, but you perceive that the lead is already beginning to turn. Silvery dew-like drops had indeed begun to form upon the dull-colored mass, and to drop with a tinkle and splash into the glass troughs. Slowly the lead melted away, like an icicle in the sun, the electrodes ever closing upon it as it contracted, until they came together in the center, and a row of pools of quicksilver had taken the place of the solid metal. Two smaller electrodes were plunged into the mercury, which gradually curdled and solidified, until it had resumed the solid form with a yellowish brass shimmer. "'What lies in the molds now is platinum,' remarked Raffles Haw. "'We must take it from the troughs and refix it in the large electrodes. So, now we turn on the current again. You see that it gradually takes a darker and richer tint.' Now I think that it is perfect. He drew up the lever, removing the electrodes, and there lay a dozen bricks of ruddy, sparkling gold. You see, according to our calculations, our morning's work has been worth twenty-four thousand pounds, and it has not taken us more than twenty minutes, remarked the alchemist, as he picked up the newly made ingots and threw them down among the others. We will devote one of them to experiment, said he, leaving the last standing upon the glass insulator, to the world it would seem an expensive demonstration which cost two thousand pounds, but our standard, you see, is a different one. Now you will see me run through the whole gamut of metallic nature. First of all men, after the discoverer, Robert saw the gold mass, when the electrodes were again applied to it, change swiftly and successively to barium, to tin, to silver, to copper, to iron. He saw the long, white electric sparks change to crimson with the strontium, to purple with the potassium, to yellow with the manganese. Then, finally, after a hundred transformations, it disintegrated before his eyes and lay as a little mound of fluffy gray dust upon the glass table. 
and this is protyle said haw passing his fingers through it the chemist of the future may resolve it into further constituents but to me it is the ultima thule and now robert he continued after a pause i have shown you enough to enable you to understand something of my system this is the great secret it is the secret which endows the man who knows it with such a universal power as no man has ever enjoyed since the world was made this secret it is the dearest wish of my heart to use for good and i swear to you robert mcintyre that if i thought it would tend to anything but good i would have done with it forever no i would neither use it myself nor would any other man learn it from my lips i swear it by all that is holy and solemn his eyes flashed as he spoke and his voice quivered with emotion standing pale and lanky amid his electrodes and his retorts there was still something majestic about this man who amid all his stupendous good fortune could still keep his moral sense undazzled by the glitter of his gold robert's weak nature had never before realized the strength which lay in those thin firm lips and earnest eyes surely in your hands mr haw nothing but good can come of it he said i hope not i pray you most earnestly do i pray you i have done for you robert what i might not have done for my own brother had i won and i have done it because i believe and hope that you are the man who would not use this power should you inherit it for selfish ends but even now i have not told you all there is one link which i have withheld from you and which shall be withheld from you while i live but look at this chest robert he led them to a great iron-clamped chest which stood in the corner and throwing it open he took from it a small case of carved ivory inside this he said i have left a paper which makes clear anything which is still hidden from you should anything happen to me you will always be able to inherit my powers and to continue my plans by following the directions which are here expressed and now he continued throwing the casket back again into the box i shall frequently require your help but i do not think it will be necessary this morning i have already taken up too much of your time if you are going back to elmdene i wish that you would tell laura that i shall be with her in the afternoon End of chapter 11